Well, we continue again uh, this week with the story of Jeremiah. For those of you that have been following along, this week we get to the Black Friday of edition of, of Jeremiah here, chapter 32. Bye, bye, bye. You may be wondering why in the world Pastor Jeff would choose this obscure passage about Jeremiah buying a field. Have any of y'all read this story before? It's not interesting. <laughs> but it is. But it is. Well, sometimes God's most wonderful messages are in what seem as some of the most mundane readings. So let's talk about these ideas of home and land for a moment. The holidays always direct my attention home. There's a phrase that says, you can't go home again. Have you all heard this before? It's often referencing a 1940 Thomas Wolfe novel by the self-title. But this larger thought and idea has been around for a much longer than that. It describes this dichotomy between our idealized notions of what our homes and communities are. And oftentimes, the sometimes disheartening realities that we experience upon returning to these places. Jesus talked about this briefly in the Gospels as he says that a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. And we often experience this when we travel back to our childhood homes and neighborhoods only to realize that the land and the people have often changed or disappeared altogether. <clears throat> Perhaps the holidays are the most poignant reminders of this idea as we experience the joys and sorrows of family and hometown meetings and all that such gatherings entail. If we were to zoom out a bit and take on a larger perspective, Humanity's connection with land and our notion of home is a bit complex. We see this complexity of our relationship with land even today. For example, many of us have a strong connection with the natural world, specifically in the Pacific Northwest around us. This is our land, we say. Not anyone else's. Just ask many of those California migrants here who have migrated north, how, much, how such understandings of land and identity were communicated to them when they arrived. <laughs> if we were to expand this conflictive idea of land ownership, we see it today in the ongoing debate of our nation's borders, especially along the Mexican border today. As a nation, we even went so far as to build a wall to let people know which land they are allowed to live on. A practice, by the way, that goes back thousands of years to the earliest of civilizations, we even read about it in our Bibles. For many indigenous peoples, such as the Native American tribes, the idea of owning and selling land to individuals was a bit confusing. One quote that is attributed to Chief Crowfoot of the Blackfoot Nation, who lived in the mid-19th century, talks about land in this way. Our land is more valuable than your money. It will last forever. It will not even perish by the flames of fire. As long as the sun shines and the waters flow, this land will be here to give life to people and animals. We cannot sell the lives of men, women, and animals. Therefore, we cannot sell this land. It was put here for us by the Great Spirit, and we cannot sell it because it does not belong to us. But for many cultures, especially within these Western societies, one's land was and still is closely tied to identity. The connection between the land and the Celtic culture, for example, is closely bound through song, spirituality, and family. And this connection certainly is present within our biblical stories, as we read from many of the very first stories of Genesis, where it was God who promised our ancestors the faith particular lands to build families and even nations. And so we can understand then how gut-wrenching 
it must have been for Jeremiah and the Israelite people to be overrun by the Babylonians and for many of the Jewish leaders to be forced into exile, forced to leave the very land they believed were promised by God. Sixty years, two or three generations, it was about 60 years that the Jewish people lived as prisoners over 500 years before Jesus was even born. For 30 chapters in his self-titled book, Jeremiah experiences the torment of being the bearer of such bad news. And then in chapter 31, the tides seem to change for Jeremiah. We hear from God with a new message, this time of hope and a future. This is chapter 31, verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And in chapter 32, we read today's story of Jeremiah being told by God to buy land once again. This is chapter 32, verse 14. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both the seal deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. What seems like a mundane detail in Jeremiah's story is actually quite significant and revolutionary for the Israelites. After years and years of not knowing where to call home, God is saying to the people, this is the time. This is the place. It's time to come home. Today's good news, God calls us home time and time again. No matter where we have been, what we have accomplished, who we have met, we are called home by our Creator at one point or another. Perhaps you have your own story of being so called. Even if we are miles and miles away from where we were raised as children, God calls us home. When the world is not as it should be and there is trouble, conflict, and pain in our lives each and every day, God calls us home. When our earthly existence in this world will surely end as it does for all, God calls us home. We are called to settle in. Make it official. Put down roots and embrace God's home, a place of love, security, and warmth in our lives. And here is something more for us to think about today as we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. We do so knowing that our understanding of home does in fact change and evolve over time. For Jeremiah and the Israelite people, the physical city of Jerusalem was home. It still is even today. But Jesus, who lived out his reign on this earth, voluntarily choosing no physical home to call his own, expanded our understanding of what home truly is when it comes to being children of God. Yes, our physical earthly homes are important. We experience that connection within our very beings. But the difference for the teachings of Jesus is that his home was never bound to a single location, a city, or people. Time and time again, he preached of God's kingdom, already here and not yet realized throughout the entire cosmos. God's kingdom is not a specific place or time. Jesus taught us that we will be surprised by who is there and who is not. For Jesus, the Christ, the King of kings, the kingdom of God, our true home is already among us. 
perhaps this is an especially appropriate message for the holiday season, as we are told time and time again by those advertisements to buy, 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 and collect as many possessions as possible in order for us to create that perfect home we imagine. Friends, we may not ever be able to return to the homes we have idealized as children. Time is simply too persistent. Things on this earth naturally change. But God does call us home time and time again. As Jeremiah reminds us, no matter what we are experiencing, God does not forget us. And Jesus reminds us that no matter where we are in life, or in this world or beyond, we are home in God's kingdom. And for this, we can give thanks. Amen.